All right, now the first thing I want to say before I forget is that when I sat down to read The Late Show, I literally laughed my hiney off. I'm telling you. Now, when I looked at the cover of the book, I knew that I was not part of the target audience. Mm -hmm. But that was very funny to me. I was going to say, the reason you're laughing is because you never expect to be that old, and that's a real funny situation. Well, well funny enough, um, no, you may smack me across my face, but at 31, my friends and I, we're still getting a little nervous because sometimes we go, oh, God, we forgot stuff. We're getting old. And that book really did address a lot of the issues that we think about right now. Kim, I like your saying that you laughed because I'm such a serious little person and my messages are always serious. But one of the things that's good about my writing is that it's funny. <laughs> and I'm glad you caught well, that. I, I think that's what really gets good, people, too. Good. I mean, you, you put across a very good message, but funny. You did it in a very funny way. Um, when I got to the chapter on marriage, now what I wanted to know is, you got married in your, what, mid-30s? Late. All right, late 30s. Now, was that a conscious decision, or is that just the way the turn of events were? It was a little bit conscious, and I don't see why other people couldn't do that. I decided, kiddo, you've been out there running around and having love affairs, and sometimes good, sometimes not so good, <laughs> and it's time to get married. Now, when you have um, a pretty high-profile marriage, like you and uh, Mr. David Brown has, any number of times we know that men sometimes trade their wives in for somebody half her age or even less than that. Please! <laughs> I, mean, I thought we were doing fine until no, now. I mean, have you, have you ever thought about anything like that? The reason it isn't a serious threat, I believe, is that he did it twice before. He didn't trade the wife in for somebody younger, but he had had two previous marriages, and apparently it's a lot of trouble and a lot of trauma to have a divorce, no matter who's at fault, and he didn't want to do it again, and that's why he didn't want to get married again. He did it twice already. It was tough, but having married me, I was pretty sure he wasn't going to go through it all over again. Besides... I'm a younger woman. I'm six years younger than he. <laughs> <laughs> well, like they say, I mean, third time's a charm, so maybe that's mm -hmm. the way that worked. I know I've noticed, too, that um, always keeping up with what uh, high-profile people are doing, any number of times I read that there are rumors that um, people have cover-up marriages, like one of the spouses is really gay and the other person's married. Now, and all the friends that you've met, have you ever found a situation like that? Yes, there has been such a situation, may I say, categorically and empirically and pompously that everybody's marriage is his or her own business. In your marriage, do you really want absolute fidelity or do you even believe in that? Before I was married, I was with some real rat burgers. <laughs> <laughs> Womanizers, I think they are called. And the reason they have so much success with their women is because they are so devastating. They are absolutely delicious. They are fabulous men sexually uh, in terms of attraction, maybe brains, maybe achievement. They are devastating. And they do have other girls than you, their so-called dearly beloved. And it nearly killed me. I thought I wouldn't live through it. And I was with one of them for many years, which we shouldn't be going into the story of my <laughs> life, it's too late. At any rate, I never thought I could ever be with a man who cheated uh, if he were my husband. And that was one of David's great attractions to me. Prior to getting married, though, um, in, in The Late Show, I think you state that you had been, um, how can I put this, like a mistress or maybe with someone who had been married before or was married at the time? <laughs> I mean, like, how do you I reconcile had, that with, with, with... Oh, numerous married men were in my life. We probably don't have time or you don't have the desire <laughs> to go into my rationale about married men. But if you're single and you've been without somebody to be really madly in love with for a few weeks or months and you're lonely, why not take it out on a married man? You <laughs> use him. That term is not pejorative in my right, right. analysis. You use him the way he uses you. You use him for sex, for adoration, for dinner, for friendship. Maybe he helps you with your career. And he, in quotes, uses you as somebody who is a sexual object, somebody that he probably adores, maybe even will fall in love with. No, it's not wonderful for his wife at home if she knows about it. That's her problem. 
when you get your first big paycheck, or what you consider your first big paycheck, what was the first thing you did? May I say, Cam, when I was 31 years old, I was making $9,000 a year. So oh. don't, <laughs> don't, don't talk to me about that. And I never, I never got one big paycheck that was different from any other that I ever got. But it's been a long, long, long time baby since I've worked for money or a paycheck. I've said in the last few years at Cosmo, I would have paid them. I didn't want the word to get around. <laughs> You've been at Cosmo now for how long? 32 years. And now I'm doing the international editions as a new editor-in-chief of U.S. Cosmo, which is the appropriate thing, because how long uh, should I be the one to do that? I would have gone on forever. I don't think I ever would have uh, said, I quit. <laughs> but they told me that it was time, and they made a very wonderful arrangement for me to be the editor-in-chief of the international editions. Now, do you have a hand at all in the U.S. edition of Cosmo Absolutely anymore? not. <laughs> so Absolutely. That's all it belongs over. to the new editor and her staff. All those years that you were the editor-in-chief, those were your ideas that we were seeing? I mean, you, or we saw what you felt. Mm -hmm. You okay. saw what I felt as a very good way of putting it, because Cosmo was all about getting somewhere from nowhere. And if you could start as unprepossessing, nothing burger, mouse burger, That's as right. me, mouse burger is and, what you get, and get along just by doing the best you could, then... Wasn't that a good idea to try? Now, I uh, read an article that stated that you had nothing bad, of course, to say about the Hearst Corporation when you stepped down. I'll say. That it was just age. Mm hmm Simply age. The Hearst Corporation, Cosmo was, is, I believe, their most important right. property. And they can't sit around waiting for me to... To, to die at my desk, they did the right thing. They picked a new, wonderful, terrific editor and said, she's going to be the one. We'll make your life pleasant and palatable uh, for, I think, you know, it's, I don't know how long it'll go on, but they are very honorable and grateful for what we did together, and I have nothing but gratitude. I thank you very, very much for sitting down with me. You're a very good listener.